sons and conquerors. Jesus Christ, our Lord, in Jesus. Everybody wants a hero. Everybody needs a friend. Mm, shoulder to lean on. Everybody needs a helping hand. Welcome to this evening's Bible study. Let us go to God in a word of prayer. Shall we bow? Heavenly Father, we humbly approach the throne of grace, giving thanks for blessing us with this opportunity to come before you and study another portion of thy word. We pray that the things that we do and say are pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, and that you continue to be our guiding force throughout our lives. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your manservant that will shortly come before us and break unto us the bread of life. We pray that you continue to bless him with and crown his head with wisdom and knowledge as he reaches out to the world to Proclaim thy truth to everyone that he comes in contact with. This is our prayer, and it is in the name of Jesus that we beg of all things. Let us all say amen. Now I present to you tonight's teacher. Hello and good evening, family and friends, saints of God, lovers of the truth. Welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. Now, family, you know we rise to give God glory. And we still rise to give him praise, for our great God is worthy to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. We thank the Lord for who he is, and we praise him for the mighty things that he has done. Come on, someone. You know, no one but the Lord woke us up this morning, and no one but the Lord has kept us sound and in our right minds. We give God the glory from whom all blessings flow, because we realize and recognize that had the Lord not been on our side, we never would have made it through our difficulties, and we never would have made it through our sadness and sorrow. We wouldn't be here today if it had not been for God's grace, God's mercy, God's unconditional love, and we thank the Lord for his saving power. Listen, I'm fishing for a witness on a Wednesday night. I don't know why you're making me fish very long. You know that God has been good. You know that the Lord is worthy of praise. And so we've come here today to involve ourselves in spiritual nourishment and encouragement for our souls. Come on, who has come here and you need joy in your life? You're looking for strength. You're looking for renewed faith, renewed optimism, renewed perspective. Come on, someone. I'm grateful that we can come to the word of God and we can receive spiritual strength so that we can continue to run this race called life that we might make heaven our eternal home. I'm just thankful to be on uh, the Lord's side. Amen. Amen. I know you are too. And so as we gather here on today, we want to send a special shout out to all who are watching us all over the nation. We receive wonderful commendations and messages of encouragement. And so we thank God for your partnership. We know that you have a choice where you will go and spend time in Bible study, especially during the work week. And we don't take it for granted. We don't take it lightly that you've chosen to come here and study the word of God with the saints at South Union. And speaking of saints, to my brothers and sisters, the superlative saints of the South Union Church of Christ. Come on, you already know what time it is. Oh, how, yes, sweet it still is. That's right, to be a child of the King. Now listen, if you have your Bibles, if you have your electronic devices, let's get right down to business on this Wednesday night. Why don't you navigate over, open up your Bible, meet us or beat us. Titus chapter 1, the book of Titus chapter 1. To Titus, my own son after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order 
the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now family, on tonight we plug into another exciting study on spiritual leadership. And on tonight we will address our focus on bishops or elders bishops and elders, the strength of spiritual leadership. Of course, on tonight, we begin with bishops and elders. Now, it's important for us to remember these words and these terms because many times they are used interchangeably in the New Testament. When we speak of a bishop, we're speaking of the word episkopos, now, the word episkopos refers to an overseer, someone who watches over a particular assignment and duty. And then there's the word elder, which is presbyteros. This word elder or presbyteros gives the function of one who watches over the flock, according to Acts 20 and verse 28. So functionally, we see the presbyteros and we see the episcopos, we see the elder, and we see the bishop. When you refer to a bishop as an elder, uh, it's an older man or a gray-bearded man or an aged man. But if you're speaking as of a bishop, then you're speaking to one that has been given oversight, one who is to guard the flock, one who is to walk among the flock, one who is to counsel with the flock. And so, these particular words could be used interchangeably in the New Testament, and oftentimes we see that they are. Now on tonight, we want to uh, focus in on Paul writing to Titus and also writing to Timothy as he gives them the character traits for men who desire the office of bishop or of elder. Now, before we begin, let me draw a parallel and a working relationship between the man of God and the bishop or the elder. Now, this is why it's important for the man of God or the minister, the preacher, the evangelist uh, to live by a certain code of conduct, to conduct uh, himself according to ethical principles and high moral standard and values because it is the job of the man of God, the each Elohim, the preacher, the evangelist, to teach the entire congregation. But it is also his job to look out and to see leaders among the people and then train and ordain leaders. Simply put, if the man of God, the preacher, the evangelist, is going to train or, and ordain the elders, then he himself, needs to be a certain character individual. Are you with me? It's difficult to teach what you don't know. And it's difficult to teach others how to live if you're not living a certain way yourself. You don't want to be a hypocrite and say to an elder or to a bishop, this is what thus saith the Lord, if you're not following the word of God yourself. Very important. Now, why are you drawing lines under this, Brother Preacher? Because these are not ordinary positions that should be passed out to just any man in the local church. Uh, being an elder or being a bishop, being a deacon, being a, an evangelist is not given by popularity. Shouldn't even really be given by skill only, 
We're going to find that you can have skill, but if you don't have the other character traits and the spirit and demeanor, the disposition of an elder, then you are disqualified. So it's very important for a man to have the ability, but the man also needs to have the right attitude. Are you with me? Now let's start on this spiritual and scriptural journey on tonight. Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. For this cause, Paul says, left I thee in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Titus is given charge and commission to set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city. Now, when you approach this text, please approach it according to how it is written. Notice the first directive is to set in order the things that are wanting. That's direction number one. The second directive and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. So number one, Titus is given the responsibility of setting things in order. And then secondly, ordaining elders. Now, why is this important, Brother Preacher? This is important because if a man is going to ordain spiritual leadership in the Lord's church, the man of God must first set things in order. And a lot of times we don't give much attention to setting things in order. But what could that be? Well, it may include setting up an organizational structure. In other words, organizing the church, making sure that ministries are set, making sure that you have people in designated spots and positions to serve within the church, to serve within the community. Setting things is not including ordaining elders. Ordaining elders is after setting things. You see, this is why we have a lot of confusion in churches today, because it's difficult to ordain in chaos. Come on, somebody. Come on, help me. Help me teach on tonight. How can a man ordain an elder in chaos if the preacher hasn't done his job first? The first and foremost the gospel must be preached. The word of God must be preached. The church needs to be healthy. You see, because if the church is not healthy in doctrine and in understanding the doctrine, then many times you will appoint someone to a position that they don't even understand what their job scope and assignment really is. We first of all have to teach the word of God. Amen. And the preacher is held accountable. You have to preach. You have to teach. You have to teach morality. You have to teach honesty. You have to teach people of how to evaluate situations appropriately, properly. Teach self-control. All of these different points and different principles need to be taught from the pulpit, from the preacher, need to be preached, need to be explained, need to be explored. Because here's the tragedy. If the preacher fails to properly organize things and then begins to train and ordain, all you're doing is multiplying your chaos. Are you following what I'm saying? Right here, it's in the text. Set things in order. That's one. And ordain. That's two. Two separate functions that must be adhered to. Look at verse six. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. Now this word blameless has tripped up some over the years, but it means that this person is above reproach. This person uh, is above scandalous rumors that are not founded. In other words, charges don't stick. This person 
doesn't mean that they are perfect. It doesn't mean that they are without any sin and have never sinned. That's not what it means, because if that's what it meant, then nobody could ever become an elder. Nobody could ever become a bishop. Nobody could ever become a deacon or a preacher if we have to be sinless. But what it means is that the talk among his name is not in some kind of scandal. Are you with me? He's free from accusation. Yeah, you may have some people that don't like him, but there's not a scriptural reason as to why. Uh, you may have some people that don't agree with him, but there's not a scriptural reason as to why. In other words, his life does not disqualify his service. Are you following what I'm saying? The way he lives, the way he carries himself. If you see this man and if you hear of his man, uh, if you hear this man's name called, you don't automatically associate it with something that's unethical or something that's unscriptural or something that's unreasonable or something that is unbecoming of a Christian. So if you just throw out a name and say, oh, uh, brother, do brother, uh, do right by him every day, sir. <laughs> Trying to make sure I don't pick a name that anybody has. Brother, do right by him every day, sir. If brother do right by him every day, sir, when you say his name, if alarm bells start ringing and you, you start thinking of well, the man is mean or the man is, um, is um, covetous or the man, uh, he's, a, he's a street guy. If you start thinking of that, then that man is probably not the person you want to put up before the people. When you say a name, you need to associate it with good things. Are you following what I'm saying? Associated with godliness. This man should be associated with good works. This man should be associated with a good demeanor, a good disposition, a positive outlook. He's one that if you heard his name, you wouldn't be shocked that he's serving in a position of authority, um, dealing with morality and values. You wouldn't be shocked. It wouldn't throw you by surprise. This man has a good reputation of who he is and has presented himself as an upstanding Christian in the community. As a matter of fact, um, blameless. This man, when others hear his name, and we're going to find out, when others hear his name, even outside of the local church, they think well of him. Are you with me? Oh, yes, I know uh, that brother. He's a good guy. He's a good man. He's an honest man. This is what you really want to hear. Because a lot of times we say, well, people are good guys, good men. But no, you want to hear that he's an honest man. You want to hear that he's kind, that he's approachable. You want to hear that he's caring. Now, someone may say, well, why do we need to hear all of that? Why is that important? Because this man is going to have oversight over people's souls. Here it is. God is entrusting him to be a manager over souls. So you want the manager to manage souls properly. Now, here's one thing I know about the church. We are all God's children. Are you following what I'm saying? We're all God's children. And the last thing you want to do with someone else's child is abuse them. Come on, talk back to me. You want to see parents jump outside of their skin. You want to see parents transform and metamorphosize into something else. <laughs> do you want to see parents to go through a metamorphosis and become something else? hurt their children. Just like God does not want his children hurt or offended, we have to remember that as leaders, as spiritual leaders, we're handling another man's children. So we have to be careful about how we lead. You don't want someone to abuse your children. You want someone to encourage your children. Are you following what I'm saying? You want someone to counsel with your children. You want someone to uh, give advice that's scriptural and sound, sage, godly. Give that to your children because your children are depending on that supervision, right? Come on, help me lift this up a little higher. We are managing, we are guarding over God's heritage. Not lording, but guarding. 
which means that we have to be gentle. We have to be caring. We have to be considerate. Now, there are times where you have to discipline when um, a brother or a sister lives ungodly or has sinned. Then you have to discipline. But even when you discipline, you have to do it with love, considering yourself. Amen? Because any of us can fall and get caught up into transgression. So Paul says, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. Now, this is where we're going to land the plane on tonight. But before we land the plane, we will address the husband of one wife. Now, in this particular text, this word or this phrase that comes out of uh, the Greek, one woman man, one woman man, or the man of one woman. Now, in view here is considered polygamy because this was a society where polygamy was endorsed and even promoted, glorified, if you will. So Paul is saying that that is not the case for an elder. An elder is to be a one woman man. Now, I know that there is much debate over uh, a marriage that ends in divorce and someone else marrying another person and whether or not uh, a man can serve because he's had a wife previously, so he can't serve now because he's married to another a woman and has another wife. I know that there is much debate on that. If you just stick with the text, one wife, one man, woman, a one woman man, which means that he is a man of fidelity. Now, what does that mean? That means that he's faithful to his wife. Now, I'm not getting into how many wives and counting wives. He's faithful to his wife. I will say this, though that if a person has only been married once, then you don't have to go back and start counting. Now, however that lands, I know that's, that's true. The emphasis is placed, however, on him being a faithful husband. Are you with me? Faithfulness is in view. In other words, he's not married and dating everyone else's wife at the same time. He's not married and dating other women. It's a faithful man because he has to be seen as an example before the flock. And this is what Peter would remind us of, that an elder must be an example unto the flock. If there were ever one particular assignment that is paramount or tantamount, it is that the elder be an example unto the flock. And in order to do that, this man should be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, there's much more in the text. Uh, since we're right here, we'll go ahead and finish verse 6. Um, husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. So in this text, we see that he needs to be a one-woman man. But also his children are expected to be faithful, are expected to be believers, are expected to be people who are under control, not loose in their morals or conduct. You wouldn't consider them as being disorderly. Now, uh, there's been debate on this too. Uh, children, does that mean that they're in the house with you? Does that mean that they're outside of the house? What does it mean? Well, let me approach that. Uh, statement which turns into a question by asking another question and the question is at what time and age does a child stop being your child that would be a question to answer at what time and what age does your child ever cease from being your child that's a good question right 
So the takeaway is, just like one woman, man, husband of one wife, the takeaway is the concept is that your children are faithful. We don't have to get into the age of your child, but your children are faithful. Are you following what I'm saying? If people looked at your children, they would say they're faithful. They're believers. Um, they are not caught up in unruliness. And the talk isn't common about their ungodliness. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, that's the emphasis of the text. That's the takeaway of the text. Uh, whether or not they are 75 and you're still alive and you're 100, or whether they're five years old and uh, they're still living with you, we don't even have to approach that if we just take the text for what it is, that they are faithful. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, I know that there's been a lot of controversy over this text, but if you stick with the intent of the text, according to the word faithful, I believe we'll be where God wants us to be. All right. We are just getting started, literally. But we're not out of text. We're just out of time. So since we're out of time, we're going to pause for the calls right here and land this plane on this Wednesday night and pick up with this again next Wednesday. All right. We thank you for tuning in on tonight. Pray, hope that something is said that has been encouraging to your soul. Listen, if you'd like to partner with us in Bible study or prayer, please give us a call. The number is there on your screen, and we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to talk with you. We'd love to chat with you. We would love the opportunity to pray with you and for you as God continues uh, to brighten your days. And now until next time, we want you to know that right here at South Union, hey, we still love you. And there's not a thing that you can do about it. Be blessed in the Lord. Have a peaceful, prosperous, and a very productive week. We'll see you again real soon. Take care and good night. Ladies and gentlemen, get ready as we celebrate 70 years of God shining his glory, goodness, and grace upon South Union Church of Christ. Mark your calendars every Sunday for the month of September. Worship begins at 9 a.m. with a different speaker each week. Week 1, Evangelist D.B. Holly of Memphis, Tennessee. Week 2, Evangelist Jerry Houston of San Antonio, Texas. Week 3, Evangelist Darwin L. Mason Jr. of Nashville, Tennessee. Week 4, Evangelist Christopher Dardar of Fort Worth, Texas. Week five, Evangelist Irvin Seamster of Dallas, Texas. That's right, five weeks of five dynamic speakers, magnificent singing, and great fellowship as we celebrate South Union's 70 years. It's a September to remember.
Let's